Okay, so um, now you know all about me. So who are you? Are, so how many of you are students? Okay, I'm third to a fourth. How many of you are, how many, did, how many of you did Bev make you pay you to come? <laughs> None of that. Okay, so you don't pay. That's good. Okay. Um, and how many are non-student community members? Okay. How many are, are parents or family members of somebody with autism? How many have autism? Okay. Good to know. Oops. Wait. I got to get back to this other thing. All right. Time out. No, nah, I can do that. This is like the one thing I can do. Ah, here we go. And then you are right down here. Here. All right. Okay. So I get to talk tonight about my favorite thing, which is early identification, um, and some opportunities and challenges that we have. And I, let's see. okay. So these are the things I'm going to try to talk about in the next hour and a half, it, hour-ish. Um, just a brief historical perspective of autism and um, how it's our concept of it and everything has evolved over the past 20 or so years. Uh, I want to talk about opportunities and challenges that are associated with early detection um, and why it's important. What, what the early behavioral features of autism look like. Um, some limitations in current service del del delivery models and then um, why isn't it showing the other part? Okay, and then how interactive screening can be helpful in expediting um, autism specialized intervention. And then I also am going to talk about uh, a new project that, that we um, were awarded from the, the state, a new grant that has a lot to do with early detection. Um, I need to disclose that I am an author of the STAT, the Screening Tool for Autism in Young Children, and I'm going to be talking about that. And I do receive royalties from sales as an author. So many of you may have seen this, um, this graph that's on the Autism Speaks website that illustrates the, the prevalence, the in dramatic increase in prevalence of autism um, over time. So um, this is when I came into the field. So it was uh, a very different time from now. The prevalence was three or four out of 10,000. So it was a very, very, very rare disorder. Nobody knew about autism. Nobody had heard that word. If you say um, we didn't have um, politically correct language in terms of disability talk at that time, so if you said um, I work with autistic children, they would think that I was an artist working with artistic children. Um, it, infantile autism was, was first at this time. It just got into the DSM um, Diagnostic um, Classification Index, which is the Bible of Diagnosis. Um, in special education, there was no category. Children with autism were educated under the other health impaired category. There was one autism journal. Funding and research were, were scarce. Um, nobody would say the word autism in their house or see it in a newspaper or see it on TV or in movies. Uh, at that time, um, we thought of autism as a lifetime diagnosis. Once you have it, you've got it. Um, and the majority were, um, were thought to be um, very significantly impaired. I think about 25% at that time were thought to have um, average intellectual ability, or at 25 or at maximum. So now we have uh, things are a little bit different. And so the prevalence is, is way up here now. Um, the, newest report that just came out said that um, it is, autism is now one in 50 children. Uh, that just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, it's considered an urgent health, uh, public health concern. And uh, now, as you know, it's a household word. It gets lots of media coverage. Uh, we recognize now that there's a great deal of variability in what autism looks like from one child to another child. Um, and that actually, uh, in the last CDC report in 2012, um, they, um, the finding was that a minority had intellectual disability, which, which is a very big change. So, we're, so what autism looks like now is very different from when it, it, what it looked like when I started out in the field. Um, between um, the 80s and now, there have been lots of really important changes. One is we've recognized the importance of early detection, which I'll, I'll talk about. We've realized the effectiveness of early intervention. 
we know a lot more about the early behavioral features and how to identify these children. There's some screening tools we now have. Um, there, are the, there are some more standardized diagnostic measures, and we understand more about the risk factors for autism. So I'm going to be talking about these things. First, I always like to start this way, um, why early detection is important. And there are um, several reasons for this. And the first is that the diagnosis of autism is, is often the ticket to specialized services. Children with autism um, don't benefit in the same way from gen generic intervention and playing on the floor with somebody once a week. They have um, kind of a, a triple whammy of characteristics that um, really necessitate a, a unique and, and very different and specialized approach to intervention, which I'll, which I'll talk about. Um, but when, you, when they get this intervention at young ages, um, in the past 10 years, we found dramatic improvements, more than we, we, I ever would have guessed from the olden days. Uh, but we had early, autism specialized early um, intervention has been associated with significant gains in language, social interactions, behavior, um, and even cognitive skills. So it's, it's really a, um, a remarkable thing. And it does suggest that the, these core deficits of autism are malleable, and they, they can be changed, um, especially at a time at young ages when the brain is rapidly developing. There are lots of reasons that early intervention is, should be important, and, um, and there, there's research from developmental psychology and from neuroscience and from economics um, that all indicate that you know, acting early is a good thing. Um, we know that brain development and, and skill learning um, are influenced not just by genetics, but also by experience. We know that experience or environmental influences can be positive or negative, and the positive um, period. Um, and we know that the early years of life are a really important time because the brain is, so, is developing so rapidly and we can have a bigger impact. So what we want to do with these children is provide the positive, um, the positive stimulation and experiences they need so that we can actually change uh, the architecture of their brain and, and, have, um, and change their behavioral trajectory as well. So this is um, a, my very crude model of development, um, where if you, if you can think of development as occurring in a, a vertical, in this case, like one block building on another block, and that in typical development, it's, um, there's, a, there's a sturdy foundation, the blocks build upon each other, and they're steady, it's not tipsy. Um, and when um, in atypical development, you may see like even a slight change early on that may really affect development later on. It may be a pivotal skill that really cascades into other, other areas of development and can kind of help make development go awry. So what you can see that it's much easier to um, intervene when um, they're less distant from um, what we would call the norm than later on when, they, when it's, their behaviors are more ingrained and they're farther, they're looking they're looking more impaired than they did earlier. So what we want to do when we see atypical development occurring is we want to intervene right there as soon as we see it so that we can um, foster as, as typical a developmental pathway as possible. So that's uh, it's a simple graphic, but I think it, it makes sense. <laughs> the second, it does to me. The second reason um, that early detection is important is um, for families. So. Families of young children with autism are often very confused by their behavior. These children look like other kids, and a lot of times they act like other kids. And um, so some of their behaviors can be very puzzling, very confusing, and very frustrating for parents, um, whether or not they've had children before. But they may find that parenting strategies that they've used with their other children just don't work with these kids, and they start to um, reflect on what they're doing wrong and what's wrong with um, the child and um, you know lots of negative attributions can develop so if once we can explain to parents what's going on um, it it gives them some tools and some strategies it gives them access to support and other parents um, and other families and um, to make family life a little bit more um, more tolerable and then third uh, 
by understanding early, the early development of autism mm -hmm. and, the, and the behaviors that are um, core features as opposed to later developing sequelae, um, we will know a lot about how autism develops, about different developmental pathways, about what causes what, uh, about where the best places are to intervene. Um, and here's an example of that. So I think we can probably all agree um, that the autism, the core social impairment of autism, it, the core impairment is social, and that these children really have difficulty. Um, you know, I, actually, this brings to mind the point. I didn't actually say what autism is, but um, it involves too many. That's <laughs> because the slide wasn't there. So there are two. Right, the diagnosis actually just changed. Um, so there are two, now two main diagnostic criteria for autism. Um, I think I'll, I am going to get to it later, but it's social communication and interaction is one, and then restricted and repetitive behaviors are another. So uh, core, uh, social impairments have thought for a long time to be the, the core deficit in autism. But they can, uh, we need to figure out what's underlying those social deficits. It could be a couple of different things, um, or many more. One, it could be social motivation. Are these um, children just not driven to interact with other people? Do they not derive um, pleasure from interaction? Um, is it, um, and then we have, there's some lines of research that have suggested this. Um, they don't orient to people, and this is at young ages, um, they don't um, attend or orient to uh, um, other people as much. They don't share positive affects or smile socially to other people. Um, their social reward systems, the way the brain works, may be a little bit different. Um, and that could certainly create um, some social impairments. But on the other hand, um, it, maybe it's due to some kind of attentional or sensory issue. So we have, there are some theories about that too, that uh, it has to do with attention and um, difficulty shifting attention and disengaging attention and, um, and knowing what to attend to. Or it could, have, um, it could be affected by how the senses are being integrated at the at input from the senses are being integrated at the brain level and um, maybe auditory and visual information isn't integrated in the same way which makes things very confusing um, and these attentional issues can play out more in the social domain because social stimuli are very quick they're think of facial expressions um, they change quickly they mean a lot there's a lot of meaning the face helps you understand what the uh, what the language what the words are um, but if you can't uh, put together what the face means with what the words are it's hard to learn language first of all and it's hard to read social cues so um, it could be both of these it could be neither of these it could be um, one or the other but they do have different implications so if it's social motivation then we really need to develop strategies to um, to make social interaction rewarding for these children. And then if it's attentional, and this is a great simplification, of course, and then if it's attentional or sensory processes, we really want to develop strategies that are going to improve, help um, improve visual attention um, and auditory attention and how they work together. Um, and that's, and you know, I think I would probably argue that most good interventions do these things, whether or not they, they say that they do or know that they do. It's just when you work with children, with autism for a long time, you just you, things that you just find things that work and you keep doing them. But anyway, um, so that's why it's important to to figure out um, what the core deficits are, so we know we can design more tailored, specialized treatments. For over more than a decade, um, there have been practice guidelines that have advocated early early identification and early intervention. National Academy of Neurology. Um, American Academy of Pediatrics, and, and the AAP um, has really been most active, and they um, came out with very specific, specific recommendations in 2007 for um, autism-specific screenings to be conducted in general, pediatric practices on, for all kids at uh, 18 and 24 months, that um, they've developed a toolkit, which they've just revised last year. Um, the CDC has also become involved in, um, in a big program, Learn the Signs, Act Early. Okay, so we know it's important. There are all these professional guidelines that say we should do it that have been around for ten, more than 10 years. So how are we doing? I'm going to let you answer that question. So one of the most consistent findings in the literature for the past at least 20 years is that parents 
express concerns about their child's development at a, an average age of 17 to 18 months. Okay. According to the CDC, the average, and actually it's later than this, but I, I couldn't put it any later. The, the average age at which a child receives a definitive diagnosis is about three and a half to four, unless you're, you happen to be um, from a minority background and then it's five, between five and six. So obviously this is um, problematic. Um, most children, or many children, are, are not availing themselves of the early birth to three services that can really make an impact on that early brain development. So, and there's just this gigantic gap between concerns and diagnosis. So, I mean, the answer is not so what we're not doing so hot. One of the problems, I think, uh, which makes, which gives us opportunities, see, that, that's the good part. Um, I think one of the issues is that we are working from a diagnosis intervention model. And it looks like this. If somebody has concerns about autism, they refer for a diagnostic evaluation. And then after, if they get a diagnosis of autism, then they get autism specialized intervention. But that doesn't always work. It's a nice linear picture, but it doesn't really work smoothly. Um, and I, anywhere. Um, it, it, I don't know many, there are some pockets of interesting um, patterns of service provision, but this is really a problem that's nationwide and probably inter and certainly internationally. So um, the first roadblock is that there's not, uh, the early signs of autism, uh, you know, are not particularly well known. Um, so there's limited knowledge. Um, and then we, there are also, um, there are some screening tools, but it, they're not used regularly. The, one of the easiest ways to, or not easy, but um, one of the most efficient ways of do, have getting kids screened is through their p pediatricians um, and through pediatric practices. And it turns out that um, a minority of pediatricians are using autism-specific screens. And some don't even use general developmental screens. So anyway, so that, that kind of blocks the path right there. Um, then if you get referred for a diagnostic evaluation, there are often very long waits. In this community, I can, you know, I'm sure you know, there can be waits um, from nine months to a year um, to get a diagnostic evaluation. So that's problematic. Um, but if you happen to get to this part where um, there's, um, you know, you've, you've gotten the diagnosis, you've gotten the ticket to services, um, sometimes there's limited availability of people who really know autism who are, who are available to provide the services. So lots of, lots of issues with this model. Um, and of course the delays in diagnosis are going to lead to the delays in children getting the, the specialized um, intervention. And, um, and by specialized I mean intervention that is um, based on the core deficit areas of social and communication and, um, and behavioral chat difficulty understanding um, transitions and things like that, but later. So why, what is causing this delay? We know what should be done. There are practices, um, practice parameters that are out. Um, one, which I'll talk about, um, soon is the complexity of the, of the diagnosis. It's not an early di an easy diagnosis to make at young ages. It just it isn't. Um, I've been doing it for a thousand years and it's, it, hasn't, it just doesn't get easier. Um, the nature of our current service delivery model, which I just mentioned. And then also, I think the field is starting to recognize this, but the scientific knowledge we have is not being translated to the community. And this is, this is a, not a great situation. We really need um, to, I mean, we do know some things. We know some, we, there are some evidence-based practices, but they may or may not be applicable to community settings, which, have, which are, operate in a much different way than do clinical research settings. So we really need to figure out ways to bring this stuff into the community. Um, Going back to the, um, the challenges of early diagnosis, so I mentioned the, um, the new, these are the proposed criteria, it hasn't been, the new um, diagnostic manual hasn't come at, been published yet, but it's supposed to be out very soon. So the two main criteria are impairments in social communication and interaction and restricted repetitive patterns of behaviors, interests, and activities. So let's just look at um, the first one. So these are the behaviors that, that fall, or the 
the subcategories of behavior. So um, deficits in social emotional reciprocity, deficits in nonverbal communication, and deficits in developing and maintaining relationships. Okay, so what's common to all of these things? They're, they're deficits. So how do you see a deficit? And that's what's tricky. It's like a deficit is something that isn't there, and it's very hard to detect um, the absence of a behavior. It's very easy to, um, to come up with reasons and attributions for why you're not seeing the behavior. Child could be sick, child could be uncomfortable, um, child doesn't like me, um, child has difficulty separating from mom, um, but they, it's difficult to know what they mean. Second, um, parents are really good at eliciting the most social and interactive behavior they can out of their children. They'll figure out how to, how to um, get a response, whether it's throwing them up in the air or uh, there was <laughs> one child who liked to be picked up by his ears. <laughs> so, I mean, they'll just, and you'll see some, um, some videos of things, but they'll figure it out because they want to connect with, the, with their kids. Um, so, and they often don't realize how hard they, ha they are working um, if they have another, an older child, they might, but they may not know um, until, you, like, until you get into a clinician office and, and somebody actually tells you or, you or a friend tells you, you know, that's, you know you're working really hard for this. Um, and then we have the issue of like, what does social reciprocity mean exactly? And how, what are the milestones for that? I mean, we, you know, we know when you're supposed to walk, we know when you're supposed to talk. But when are you supposed to like, like respond to your name like 80% of the time? Or when are you supposed to um, follow a point or point to other objects in all different conditions? I mean, we just don't know that. We don't have those, those kinds of criteria for, social, um, for the social domain. So all of these things make, it, make it, it challenging. And then, on top of that, the social behaviors in autism, social and communicative behaviors, are not it's not an all or none thing. It's not that these children never interact. It's not that they never look at you or that they never imitate. It's that they do it, they're, they're, these behaviors are less consistent. Um, they're across settings or across people. And as I already mentioned, it's, um, the effort is, is greater. Um, as I said, okay, did I miss anything? Uh, right. And then there are also some, um, the behaviors, actual behaviors, um, the topology can be there, but the, the quality and style may be different. So um, a, a person with autism, for example, may be able to have a conversation and go back and forth, but it may not be reciprocal in that the words um, and that what, what the other, what the partner says are followed up on and responded to in a, in a back and forth way. So how, what these behaviors look like in young children are, are this. So social emotional reciprocity, we see things like, um, these are things we don't see, we see in typical children, but we don't see as in autism. Sharing enjoyment, um, showing off. This kid puts stickers all over his body and he's like showing his parents, like look, look at me. Um, imitating parents, this, this child is imitating her mom sleeping, I mean sweeping. Um, it, both initiating and responding to social games, um, pat a cake or peekaboo or um, hide and, well, this is a peekaboo. Second is developing and ma maintaining relationships. So um, again, what we don't, things we don't see so much in autism is interest in other children um, or, or younger siblings. In fact, um, there are parents will say that their, their child just doesn't, recognize the, the, the baby as a human being and is just as likely to, to like step on it if it's on the floor. Um, imitation, imitating other peers, um, imitating um, that, the actions of parents, and interactive play. This is like, this is one of my favorite. This was from a preschool where these two kids are like just doing this ridiculous thing where they're, one started biting the end of a play banana and the other one bit the other end and they are hysterical laughing. And then the one who's, wa who's watching, I mean, you, you know that he's smiling also, because this, this is just, it's just a natural thing. It's just, um, they are enjoying it, and there's something that they are driven to enjoy it. It's not something they think about. It's not something you can teach. It just happens. Um, a third, the third um, category within the social communication interaction is using nonverbal forms of communication. 
And there are two different types of communication that I want to talk about. One is requesting when you communicate because you want something from another person. And the other is directing attention. But I'll talk about requesting first. So um, here, so there are different nonverbal ways of requesting. We can reach, we can um, reach to be picked up, which is symbolic. We can reach for an object. We can point to something that we want. These are all very standard, very traditional um, ways of communicating. But the, it's very hard for children, young children with autism, to learn these. They, they don't come as naturally to them. Um, instead, you may see things like, um, like a child taking a person's hand um, as if using it as a tool to get what they want. Um, this child wanted um, the person to push down, to put the, the jack back in the box so um, to repeat the activity. Um, this person wanted the mom to, just wanted to leave the room pretty much and, and pulled the mom to where um, he wanted her to go. Some other young children may pull their, their parents to, um, to, the, to the kitchen but then not be able to tell um, what they want. They just or stand there and cry. Um, and this is a child, this is an extreme, or this child actually made no attempt to communicate and literally climbed on his mother, who was sitting on a chair, and is using her hair to steady himself because he wanted that bubble gun in the, on the top of the, um, the counter. So, um, so this, these, there's a stark contrast between what, what we um, see in typical and, um, and young children with autism. The second um, purpose of communication or function of communication where we see very big differences is directing attention. So directing attention is different from requesting, is that um, we don't communicate because we want something. We communicate because um, there, we want to share something. We want to share our enjoyment or interest in an event with somebody else. So examples are um, pointing. You know, we want to, and not because we want, not because we're saying I want that water, but we're saying, well, look at that dog, look at the moon, look at the frog, um, or isn't that cool? I blew these bubbles. Um, I, um, we can show, and these are these are two behaviors that are that are that you often do not see in young children with autism. Showing things, look what I have. Um, look, I found an Easter egg. That's a timely one for this one. Um, and then using facial expressions and gestures. Again, these are um, things that you just don't see as much. Where um, um, this just this you just you respond. We respond at a um, um, at a very deep level um, without thinking about it to other people's facial expressions, and we learn what these gestures mean early on. So just um, to emphasize, the joint attention and directing attention are not new concepts, but they have really um, become very important in understanding early autism um, because it, it, this seems to really be a, a core deficit. Uh, but it's something that has been around certainly since Dick and Jane books. And um, you can see that this boy is initiating joint attention, and all of these people are responding to joint attention, and those are the two, two big differences between typical children. And I do have a colleague who believes that the rise in autism is due to the fall of Dick and Jane books. <laughs> and it could be true. And I just, you know, I just, in preparing for this, I just noticed that, that even the dog is responding to joint attention, which I had, like, never actually noticed before. Okay, so let's talk about the second criterion, which is these restricted repetitive patterns of behaviors, interests, or activities. And these include um, stereotyped or repetitive speech um, or movements or use of objects, um, a need for routines and adherence to routines, um, very fixated and restricted interests, unusual sensory interests or reactivity. And so it could look like things like this. So this is a fixated interest. This child might be interested in wheels and he's not playing with the car in, the, in a functional way, which could be rolling it around, taking it places, putting people in and out of it, but is interested in the wheels and is interested in um, that component of other toys or objects around the house, um, the rolling aspect. Could be rigid routines. This is a child who had to play with toys in a certain way, had to line up the puzzle pieces in exactly the same way before putting them in the puzzle. 
This, there's the stereotype movements. This is hand flapping. It's hard to get a picture of a stereotype movement. <laughs> um, but um, he he's, gets really excited about bubbles and is, and is flapping his hands, um, thus the blur. Um, and then there are different kinds of sensory interests. Um, the, the child um, with the ball, just like it's one of those weird feeling balls, but he really liked to touch it in a certain way. Um, the, the guy with the pop beads really, let, he would drag them along the counter and, and look at it really, really closely, and then um, playing with the slinky um, in, the, in the same way each time, just being very preferred objects and activities, um, sometimes um, almost to the cl exclusion of other things. Okay, the, who knows what these are? The red herrings. So this is good. Who said that? Who said that? Did, did you say that? Yay. Um, so, and I put this up here because the, these behaviors are easy to see. They are not negative symptoms. They are positive symptoms. They are easy to see, uh, but they are less predictive of the diagnosis. It, if there are kids, if you don't have the social deficits, you don't have, you're not going to have autism. Um, other children have these things <laughs> for, for various reasons. Um, and, and these behaviors alone uh, actually occur throughout typical development in different forms. But, and they can be maintained certain ways. Um, but they do not, they alone do not mean autism. So that's just an important point. So when we try, what we're trying to do now is push the age of diagnosis younger and younger and younger so that we can um, intervene sooner and sooner and sooner and um, either um, uh, prevent symptoms from developing or at least mitigate the um, extent to which they Im impede other behaviors and, and subsequent development. So when we try to, and very young means um, under two, say, certainly under three, but even under two, um, we see, um, you know, 18 months, just amazing behavioral variability for young children. Infants aren't good at self-regulating. They don't regulate their behavior or emotions well. They haven't learned to do that yet. So um, they may act differently when they're hungry or, or upset or tired or, or getting sick. Um, you know, we can get sick and still come to work and function. Um, but little kids just don't, they just, they don't function well when um, phys their physiology isn't, isn't doing well. Um, also, there are overlapping symptoms with other disorders like um, develop a global developmental delay or a speech language delay. And the, the diagnostic criteria up to, to this point, and we'll see how well the DSM-5 does, but the, the DSM-4, which is the last um, set of diagnostic criteria, was really, and, and, and all those that preceded it, were really developed for younger, for older children. I mean, they were based on school-age behaviors, and sometimes they worked for preschools, but uh, preschoolers, but the, you know, the people who've worked in the field of early identification pretty much developed their own workarounds. Um, um, and their own interpretations of the criteria to make it work. So I hope that DSM-5 is better, but that's been an obstacle to early diagnosis. And then um, it'd be nice if, if, um, if all children with autism showed s signs in a predictable pattern early on, but they don't. There are lots of different um, patterns of how, th how the symptoms and behaviors of autism um, develop. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> if this is typical behavior, <clears throat> sorry, where um, the the rate is um, the um, the skills develop evenly with the time, so you make a month worth of progress for every month of age. Um, thank you for the vodka in the bottle. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the typical one. So some children with autism have, um, they show typical development, but then they, it kind of plateaus, so it doesn't like keep pace. They have typical development and then seem to lose skills or show regression, or they may just be developing slowly from day one. So depending on when you look at these children, um, you're gonna see different things. So if you look at them at young ages, you're not gonna see all the differences that you can see a little bit later on. So at different ages, kids can look really different, and um, it, just, it just muddies the waters in terms of early diagnosis. So one of the strategies we've used in this field is to 
study uh, the baby siblings of children with um, of autism. So these are siblings where there's already um, a family history of autism um, and, and an older sibling. And this actually is, um, infant sibling research is, uh, has become um, like, like the cool way to study the very earliest features because for lots of reasons. You can start from birth and follow them prospectively. You don't have to wait till they fail a screen. Um, uh, they have a, an elevated risk of, of having autism because there is a genetic component to autism. Um, it allows us to um, not just understand full-blown autism, but also understand um, the development of like kind of the spectrum of autism and that broader phenotype. Um, we can study, we can, when we, we could follow them over time, which, which we do, and really identify the patterns and the developmental sequences. We can see regression when it's there. And we can look at the genetic contributions to, um, to behavior. And, not, none, and no less importantly than anything else, and more importantly actually, is that we can assist families. These are families who already have a child with autism. Um, they're, they, know that they know the numbers, um, and we can help them through research projects by monitoring their, the baby's development and giving them input. And if, um, if we're concerned about some behaviors, we can um, let them know and they can start seeking services when um, at, at early. So um, it's, it's a good thing. And this baby, by the way, is one that was uh, one of our babies at Vanderbilt um, who came into her five-year follow-up evaluation holding the Newsweek <laughs> magazine. So that's a happy story. So there are two different types of sibling studies. One is, um, is <clears throat> starting young at birth, six months, three months, and following the, following the children prospectively over time. And the questions that we can ask with this are, well, how many of these children end up with autism? And, um, and what are the early behaviors that were predictive of it? And it's much better to, to follow them prospectively than to, um, than to look retrospectively, which is you, you already know a child has autism and then you're asking, oh, what did they look like then? It's just a, a better scientific, less biased way of doing it. And then the second, for the second type of sibling study, we compare groups of children, some high risk because they have an older sibling with autism and some low risk who have a, an older sibling who, with typical development. And this, they give us different information. And um, this, this, the latter type um, gives us information about how children who are at elevated genetic risk, because they all are, because there's genetic uh, risk for autism in their family, how do they differ from children with low, low risk peers? And this can give us information um, that could be helpful for understanding the genetics underlying autism and um, what potential mechanisms and what, what behaviors are seen in families and occur more in families, um, even if they're not um, expressed in, in full-blown symptom form. So um, the Baby Siblings Research Consortium is, is sponsored by Autism Speaks and has um, put together, ooh, I, don't, I can't remember how long it's been in existence. I would say eight, ten, eight to ten years and brought together people from um, across the U.S. and Canada and Europe um, to in the Middle East, to uh, who are all interested in learning about the the, the earliest behavioral signs or or bio or biological signs of autism, and um, by putting together our data, we got some pretty interesting um, results. So, uh, you know, I didn't write the sample sizes, but it's about four or five hundred. So, um, so there are lots of groups involved with this, and this was the first study that. Um, in 2011, it turned. It, um, we found that, um, and this is across like a, I don't know many sites, m multiple sites, that um, almost um, almost one in five younger siblings of, child, of a child with autism um, ended up with an autism spectrum diagnosis themselves. And before this, it was, the numbers were much lower. It wasn't um, the numbers from older genetic studies were, were were much lower. So this was you know a real wake up call because what this means is that. Um, no matter 
why, what the reason is for the increased prevalence of autism, um, there, it's not, it's not going to go away if one in five of their siblings is, has it also. So um, it's, I don't think people have actually acted on it yet, but it's, there is a call to action here for service delivery systems to figure out what are we going to, you know, what do we do about this. Then the, the second study that was just published this year looked at um, children in this 81 percent. It looked um, just at the, the kids who had no, no autism spectrum diagnosis. And it turns out that, that 20 percent of them had um, scored lower. They, it were, um, they, they scored differently than, than typical no, low risk children. Um, on either cognitive scores or um, autism symptoms. They didn't have full-blown autism, but they looked different from their peers as a group. Um, so there, but 61% were, see, appeared to be unaffected. Um, risk factors for this, so the, um, if they were a boy, they were more likely to fall in one of these, um, in this 39% um, less optimal outcome, and this is just at age three. Um, and if they had more than one older sibling with autism, they were also more likely to have less optimal um, three-year-old outcomes. So that was one question that we can ask with the prospective studies. Another is, well, what early behaviors, or do early behaviors predict later diagnosis? Because we want to be able to, we need to know what to look for. So um, it turns out, yeah, we, we do have some information about this. So um, in the social interaction and communication um, category, there's strong evidence for differences in social orienting and response to joint attention by 12 to 18 months. Um, use of communicative gestures, um, there's less strong evidence. Um, and then in the restricted and repetitive behaviors, um, the evidence is not as, as strong. And these are, and I'm, when I say strong, I mean replicated by different research groups. Um, so, so there is some evidence, especially in the social domain, um, that there are, there are behaviors that we know that we can look for in young children. Um, we haven't yet found differences as young as six months in terms of behavior, but people are looking at that. And now people are looking at, um, at um, electrophysiological measures um, like um, um, EEGs and event-related potentials, evoked potentials, to see if um, there are some differences in the way the brain is working that may precede um, behavioral differences. So here are some examples of what we see in little children. This is a typical, this is, this is the, um, the ESCS, which is a, a common measure. Do you use that one here? Um, early social communication scale. And it is, um, it involves lots of different activities. And this one is a wind-up toy. You just, the examiner op, turns it on and just to see what the child does, if they um, request it or direct attention to it. So this is a typical 18-month-old. Where's the sound? Okay, so could you see her social bid there? So she looks, she reaches, she puts down. So it looks like she's maybe requesting it, but she's certainly interacting. Here's another one. Okay, she points, she vocalizes, she looks up. So she is, she is sharing her interest in this with another person. Okay, and that's again, that's a behavior that you just don't see as much in, in children with autism, um, and we're not seeing as much of it in the, in the younger sibs. Here's um, a, an at risk sibling at 15 months. So is he interested in it? He's paying attention. He's looking at it. Is he sharing his interest with the other person? Not at, not at all. 
Um, okay, so that's, I think, a good example. So um, another question, is not just looking at behaviors, but again, because we have the opportunity to, to, to watch these younger, high-risk siblings grow up over time, we want to know, is there something in the developmental trajectory um, that might differentiate these children? So we have some information about this. There's um, some evidence that, um, that, these, that the children who end up with a diagnosis of autism show cognitive um, um, slowing of cognitive growth and sometimes a decline in, in scores over time, over the first 24 months. And then we, there's also there's less evidence right now that, um, that they show less social interest over time. And um, which may be why we're not finding differences at six months, because this is, um, the behaviors may, may not, because you can't, you can't publish a lack of differences, so you, you never know, you only know what your group finds or doesn't find. Um, so it, it could be that the, that the behaviors really just don't, don't differ, because in infancy there's such a wide range of acceptable behaviors, because infants are so different and so still developing. So the studies that compare the, high, the groups of high risk to low risk um, children uh, typically find behavioral differences as a group um, in the first and second years. Um, they're found in lots of different areas, cognitive skills, behavior, social communication. Um, and you know, I will say I came into this field not thinking that I would find this. I really, I really didn't. Um, and you know, and it is a phenomenon. It's um, these these children just as a group they just look different, and um, the differences are found not just for um, parent report measures but also for observational reports. So here's an example of, um, and this is during this is a, a different um, assessment. It's this, it's the stat the screening tool, and this is just a, a very simple imitation activity where the examiner models. Um, this is shaking a rattle and then gives it to the child to see if they'll imitate. Okay, so what kept her going there? It was the interaction. It, was she, it wasn't like just the rattle. It was that she kept repeating it and looking at the examiner to see if, they, if she was watching. All right, so here, this was a high-risk sibling. So she does the action, but does she do it for the social interactive aspect of it? Not so much. And she even kind of shifts her body away from the examiner a little bit. So that's a, a, and it's subtle. You know, this isn't something that's easy to see, and you don't see it all the time, but it's something to look for. Um, the big caveat with, with this, the groups of siblings, is that um, we don't know what these early differences mean. We don't know if these differences are going to be maintained over time and these children are going to end up. We know that all of them aren't going to end up with a, with a diagnosis. Um, we don't know which, which of these behaviors predict a later diagnosis. We don't know if how much a teeny weeny difference in social interaction or responsiveness at a very young age impacts things later on. We don't know if there are um, are there um, like resiliency factors, like if two that can overcome these slight genetically driven differences? We just don't know. And we don't know what, you know, what do we do when we see this? Do we intervene? Is it too soon to intervene? It, would this, is this child going to be okay anyway? Um, so really we need to, these children need to be um, followed up like we have in the, in the other studies. 
And I would also add the importance of following up beyond the age of three, because three is certainly still an early. You don't want to you know, make your conclusions about this child's life by what they did at age three. You need to see how they do in school. Um, and we did, we did a follow-up study that, um, um, of, the, of the babies at age five. And um, this was, not everybody came back, because this wasn't actually written into the grant, but so that the sample size were, was small, um, 39 high risk and 22 low risk. And we found, we looked at a, a bunch of different measures, and we found a couple of things um, in cognitive. One, it doesn't even matter what they are. They were just a couple of things. Uh, but these are all the things that we didn't find differences in. So by the age of five, I mean, these children really looked very similar in terms of how um, parents and teachers were rating them on the child behavior checklist, um, on um, their language skills, you know, so these standardized measures, they didn't look that different. So, and he, this is another example where um, we had, at 15 months, we looked at high-risk siblings and low-risk siblings, and we matched them on mental age, so, they, so you couldn't uh, attribute any differences to lower cognitive level. And we found that the, um, for both um, body re repetitive movements with the body and repetitive movements with objects were higher in the, in the high risk group, 0.09 versus 0.02 for, the, um, for body and 0.40 versus 0.22 for object. Um, so it's a very low rate, but it still is, is different. But um, there weren't any differences between the, the high-risk kids who ended up with a diagnosis and those who didn't end up with a diagnosis. So this behavior, though it may look unusual, um, is not, was not predictive of a diagnosis in this sample. Um, and and that this, the follow-up was at 33 months. And then even um, the children without a diagnosis were higher than the, the low-risk children in, in, these, in these repetitive behaviors. So it's really, so it's not like a, you know, it doesn't mean if, as, if, as a group they're different, um, that it's going to mean something for later on and for a diagnosis. So just to summarize, the, um, about 40% of siblings have suboptimal outcomes. Um, early social communicative behaviors and slowing behavioral trajectories um, within the first 18 months seem to be associated um, or a risk factor. Uh, but these between, between group differences between the high risk and the low risk um, um, may be more associated with that just that other that genetic hit that they have um, and may not mean anything in terms of um, long-term follow-up and there we need to figure out what the resiliency <coughs> factors what the risk and protective factors are um, for the different that lead to the different outcomes for that group at elevated risk so back to this model so um, so we've talked about the early challenges of diagnosis we've talked about risk factors. We've talked about the importance of early intervention. And we've talked about all of these roadblocks. So maybe it's time to think about a risk prevention model instead of this diagnosis intervention model. So um, the risk prevention model could include expanded use of screening. And this is what I think it could look like. You have, somebody has concerns about autism. Um, community providers use an interactive screen. So this is um, a different kind of screen. It's not a, where parents fill out a checklist. It's where you actually do stuff with kids um, it, for a, sh a short time, but it gives you um, information about the core deficit areas, play, imitation, social, and communication. Um, from that information, um, they, you can actually develop, you see strengths and limitations, and you can develop activities. Um, to foster the development in those areas. So you use that, you use that information to um, start intervention. You're still going to, you don't want to bypass the diagnostic evaluation. You still want, want kids to get the evaluation. Uh, but you're able to give um, families something to do and give kids some um, targeted activities uh, to help them along the way at that um, very important early age. So it could look something like this. So you conduct an interactive screen. You develop intervention goals in core deficit areas. You implement preventive intervention, and then you assess progress. Um, there are lots of benefits to this. Um, one is you're capitalizing on the brain plasticity at young ages. These are low-intensity 
interventions um, that um, I think can be translated to the community. Um, parents can understand and promote and learn how to do some of these things. And um, just by teaching people how to use interactive assessments, we're actually teaching them about what to look for and what to do. Um, so there are lots of benefits for this. We have, we have risk prevention models in lots of different areas, including medicine, for um, cardiovascular disease. We want to prevent that. So we screen um, for risk factors first. So we look, we ask questions. Um, is there a family history? Do you have high cholesterol? Do you have diabetes? Do you smoke? Um, then you in institute preventive um, uh, measures and monitoring. Well, um, exercise, diet. And then you provide more intensive intervention as needed. So, I mean, hopefully not um, bypass surgery or a stent, but, but medication. And then you can think of autism in, in a similar way. So we want to prevent um, functional impairment. Um, we, risk factors can be failing a screening measure, or it could be um, having an older sibling with autism. We can um, do some preventive things in the community or by teaching parents how to do certain things to foster social and communication development during everyday routines. And then, if, um, and then providing more intensive uh, therapies or intervention is needed. We have a model, a prevention model in education with the responsiveness to intervention model where um, you identify children who are at risk, you provide less intensive preventive strategies, monitor their progress, and then transition to more intensive strategies if needed. And we have a risk prevention model in early childhood where there's, you provide universal um, promotion um, for all children who are at risk. Um, if they need more, you provide secondary prevention, and then um, you, you provide more intensive intervention as they need it. It's a, it's a graduated system. Um, the one thing I want to add about this that I just thought of looking at this slide before was that um, some may say, well, why not give everybody the intensive intervention? And the answer is that you can't, there's, there aren't the resources for that. Plus, there aren't the resources to give everybody, to get everybody the diagnosis. So we really need to screen and get the kids the diagnosis um, who we know need it and, ju and just do this stuff in the meantime. I mean, there has to be a practical solution to the crunch that we're in. So one, so this is the stat, the, the one I have a conflict with, but it's an example of an interactive screener. It's not the only thing, um, it, uh, but it is what we use. So it's, it works as a level two screen um, which means that it comes up with a risk. Um, you get a risk score, that, so you're either at risk or not at risk for autism. There are 12 activities in play, communication, imitation. It takes 20 minutes, and it provides a standard context for observing these um, core social and communicative behaviors that are um, important, that are deficit areas. So, this, so we um, assess requesting by um, doing things like blowing soap bubbles and then giving the child the jar to see if they ask for more help or for help opening it or for more bubbles. We have directing attention items. This one is blowing up a balloon and letting it fly across the room to see if the child like directs your attention to that strange thing. Um, we have motor imitation um, items that are that you saw one of them, the rattle and play items. One of them is, is turn taking, um, rolling a car or a truck back and forth, and the other is um, and showing any functional play with a doll. So when we use it for screening, we're scoring performance on these 12 items as pass or fail, and then we're deriving a total score, and then we're um, comparing the score to a cutoff that indicates risk. But when we're using it for goal setting, we look at the specific behaviors that the child uses during each item um, at, to figure out strengths and, and needs. And then we can develop um, specific goals and activities. And I can show you that. So for um, requesting items, which I already described, so we want to look to see first whether the child requests more or requests help. And then second, which behaviors they use to request. So what, we're, the, um, what we want to consider when we're thinking about intervening is, um, again, first, does the child communicate? And then looking at this set of behaviors, if they do communicate to request. 
what did they do? Did they put the, the, uh, the adult's hand on the object? Did they hand something to the adult? Did they reach or point to something that they wanted, which would be bubbles or a food jar? Um, and whether or not they did those, did they look at an adult during this act? Um, did they vocalize using words? So this combination actually gives you very rich behavior sample. And then we think about, well, what are the potential next steps for teaching? So I'm going to show you a video and show you how this could work. Okay, so did, was he interested in the food jar? Did he want the food? Yeah, oh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, you think he, did he communicate that? Yep, he, he put the examiner's hand. He tried to get her to open the lid. Uh, oops, which behaviors did he use? <laughs> okay, I already told you. So he put, <laughs> he put the adult's hand on the object. Okay, did he do anything else? Did you see any other, did he hand it or reach or point? Hmm. I don't think, I don't think so. Um, did he look or vocalize? No. Okay. So, what, are, how, what do we do with this information? So, this is what we've got. So, one thing we could do is we can, we know he's already putting the adult's hand, so what can we get him to look at the adult during that? So, um, it's not a clear message unless you can really convey it. Now, um, I talk about eye contact and looking in a very different way than some other people because I do not believe in teaching a child to look on command. Um, and I just want to make that clear that it's, we want to teach looking within the context of a play motivating activity um, so that it gets generalized to other play social interactions and not, is not limited to performing on command. Okay, so we could do this or um, we could also, instead of putting an adult's hand on an object, we can get try. To, we can teach them how to hand an object. So, um, unfortunately, we don't have these for the same child, but um, we have examples of some of, of some of these with different child. So, so here, the goal for this child is to hand an object to a request. Okay, and this is a um, a very motivating object. It's a um, some spinning top that has lights that the, this child loves. And you'll see the strategies are um, getting at eye level with the child, using a highly motivating object, um, creating a predictable routine. In this one, it's one, two, three, go. Modeling simple language, prompting with an open hand, and then pausing for eye contact, but that's really not pertinent to this. So here, it, this is, um, okay, so you can watch this. Okay, so he didn't give it then, he just dropped it on the floor. Stop. 
would say she even paused there to get him to look. Oh, and, help. Good job. Oh, help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, did he ever end up handing it to her? Mm, kind of, a little, but got better. And so this, so this is a routine that she's created, and it's very motivating for him. He could probably do it forever, <laughs> but she doesn't want him to just be able to do it with this. So she's holding out her hand, she's like, she's putting it, um, she's helping him give it to her, and that's, that's how to teach it. A any comments about that? Does that make sense? So here is another. This is um, another example of handing something. These are um, these are uh, this is these are parents, and they found that this their child this child just loves being swung in a blanket. Uh, how do you figure this out? That's what I want to know. But they they this is what he likes to do. So again, the strategies are going to be getting at eye level, using a highly motivating activity, creating a predictable routine, modeling simple language prompting with the open hand, um, had to use some physical prompting as you'll see, and then um, it's really important to fade the prompts over, over time. So here's this one. He requesting? Yeah. Okay, so they're going to physically prompt him to sit up and put the Swing. blanket in his hand so he can give it. So then he really makes him work for it. So this isn't one. This isn't one set. I mean, this isn't magic. These are just really good principles to use. Um, so that's pretty cool. Isn't it? <laughs> so here, let's see. So here's another example of um, of requesting. This is another child who has a different method of requesting. So let's look. So did he communicate to request? Yes. Which behaviors did he use? Anything in the top three? OK. So he handed it, and then he vocalized. He said, he echoed. He said, your turn. Um, OK, so let's talk about what the next steps are for teaching. So we can, um, since he's already handing an object, we can, see, we can teach him how to hand it with eye contact. Oh, oh, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Yes. So that's a goal. It's not the only goal that you can develop, but it's, you know, it's kind of a nice matrix. You can just not change everything at once, um, but just but keep it simple. Um, and what we want to do really is give children more flexibility in um, the different ways they can communicate. Uh, all right, so this is a very different age child, but this is just an example of um, getting the child to look at the adult. But we did see it also in the top where she paused, she said one, two, and then he looked to see why she wasn't saying three. 
So, um, so here's another, another example. And this, again, eye level with the child, highly motivating activity. This is um, handing cards um, that, have, that represent songs and that the child, that the mom will then sing. Um, and creating a routine, modeling language, hold it, and holding the object um, near her eyes to like, get him to look in that vicinity. And then as soon as she gets it, she rewards. Yeah. Monkey, two little monkeys sitting near a tree. Monkeys. So she's modeling the language, so he'll learn to know. He'll learn what monkeys means. That that card means monkeys, um, and he gets what he wants. And he 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 doesn't know that he had to work hard for that. It was a natural way to teach. So those are examples of, and I think that um, activities like this can really um, can be used and can be brought into the com into community settings. So for our overarching goal for autism detection is this is my, what, my second favorite slide is to I mean we really want to move the age of of diagnosis um, so that kids can actually get early um, intervention services whether or not they're from an ethnic minority and just reduce the gap. Um, so that's the overarching goal. And we, we, um, I mentioned that we did get funding um, through the Attorney General's office through a weird, an interesting, odd um, thing for, um, to do this, to do the purpose of the grant is to lower the age of um, autism detection, especially for Latino and other underserved populations, to reduce the gap between detection of autism and then provision of early intervention services that are specialized and to help communities develop sustainable programs that will give them an integrated approach to early identification and intervention. Often um, initiatives are just identification, but then we have this the gap again between, um, okay, we've got them identified, but there's nobody to do the intervention. So we wanna see what we can do about that. So we're training um, community service providers in, in using the STAT um, to develop intervention activities and to screen. And then we're also, training families and service providers in a very easy to implement intervention um, that's reciprocal imitation training. And this is a, um, a play-based intervention. It was developed by Brooke Ingersoll, who's at Michigan State, designed specifically for young children with autism. And it's a, a behaviorally based method that is also developmental in nature. It's real easy. Um, it has been um, associated with improvements not only in imitation but also in joint attention and in language and in social interaction. So it's really got some nice data behind it. And what you do, this is all you do. Um, you sit on the floor with a child and two, you have identical sets of toys. Um, you, you imitate the child's actions and vocalizations. <clears throat> um, and you label the child's own actions um, using very, very short phrases like you saw in the previous slides. And then um, you model a new action with the toy that the child is using. So if this child is using the car, um, you'll take your own car and you'll do something a little bit different and you model that up to three times. And if they don't, if the, the child doesn't imitate, then you prompt them to imitate um, and give lots of praise. And it just, and it kind of goes on. So you're following the child's lead. The child is, you know, having fun playing the way they want to play. Um, but it's just, um, we've, we learned, a lot of us learned <clears throat> long ago that um, imitating what a child does gets their attention. And so you've got some, you're, you're eliciting social attention just by doing that. And it's, um, so it's a very simple and simple way to do it. And, um, and so we'll be teaching <clears throat> people this. So the goals of this program are, this is good timing because my voice seems to be giving out, are, um, to uh, shorten the time between when concerns arise and when screening occurs. To shorten the time between screening and intervention and to shorten the time between concerns and intervention. We still have that problem with the wait for diagnosis, but I think that there are things that we can do if we kind of shift the model to risk prevention. And then here is, this. here's Jack, who you saw before. I wanna show you nine months later. <laughs> Can't 
quite understand what he's saying, but he's he directing attention? Yes, he is. So um, we really can make a difference with these young children. That's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> That was, was with just one sip of vodka before, too. <laughs> questions? Yeah, I was curious, um, you were talking about the discrepancy in autism from like 75 and it was one in 5,000 up till now, which is like one in 50. As if that we've been able to diagnose better or has it been that the prevalence is actually getting higher? So, great question. Um, and this is, um, so there are lots of things that could account for an increase um, because it's an increase in the number of children diagnosed. So one is that there's certainly greater awareness. Um, we're diagnosing children at young ages, so that's going to add to the pool. And the diagnostic criteria have, have changed and they're, they're more inclusive now. However, um, those three factors can't account for the, you know, the, the rate at which it's increased and the increase over, you know, kind of the exponential growth over, over time. So um, people are looking into environmental causes. So there are studies of um, environmental toxins and um, um, things that, uh, they're very interesting studies, um, starting with um, when mothers are pregnant and measuring um, um, the work setting and whether there are, um, are some potential risk factors there, but it's kind of scary, I think, to know how many known neurotoxins we come in contact with every day. I mean, it's really creepy. <laughs> but so we don't we don't really know what the um, what the what the increase is. But there you know there are increases in childhood asthma as well, and childhood diabetes. So it isn't that autism is the only thing increasing. Um, so there's something going on. So, in our intervention is very important. At what age do you think it becomes less effective? Like, what's kind of the point where? Oh, I, I never. I, I mean, I, I would hate to to say. I mean, you know, the brain development is is most rapid in the first three to five years. Um, so it's just that it's you know it's you get more bang for your buck then. Um, but kids learn all the time. And as do we, you know, I wouldn't, it's like, I wouldn't say, well, you know, you're 55, you're not going to learn anymore. So it, I, it really, you know, it's just this. Right. I'm sorry. I don't mean that they would learn, but um, I teach K through two. And so all of my families, you know, are Canadian so much for the ABA therapies. And I know like the data sometimes shows that after a certain age, it's not as effective. You know what I mean about that? Um, Right. Well, what happens is that you've got a lot more behaviors. You know, by starting early, you can like do something about some of the behaviors <laughs> and not let them develop into other behaviors. So I think that's part of the challenge. But um, you know, I don't, there isn't a magic. There isn't a magic number. I mean, there you know, there are kids who start talking at, at eight, who, who never spoke before, and um, you know, so I, I, I mean, it's a it's a fair question. It's a good question. Um, but I don't, I don't have an answer to it, and I don't think there is one, and I don't think anyone would want to say what it was if there were one. Right. <laughs> but it's a, good, it's a fair question. Because there, there, there's great pressure for parents, on parents, um, to get things done really, really quickly and to um, get lots of intensive stuff, which perhaps more intensive than is, than is needed, uh, because they just want to do the right thing. You know, they want to, um, and we, there aren't data, because you can't really compare a child who's getting intervention at the first time, uh, for the first time at five with one at two. So there's not really a good way to study that either, but it's a, it's a good question. Um, and then you. What would you tell parents that are at the point of waiting for an evaluation? Um, we just had parents come back and say, you know, I don't even remember how many months out it was. So what do we tell them in the interim? Where do you work? Uh, Stanford Public Schools. 
And, and what age are you talking about? Uh, first grade. Uh, well, you know, I don't think everybody, I, the waiting lists vary. So if you want to go to a certain place, then there could be a longer waiting list than other places. Um, so, you know, and, and for the diagnosis, the, the problem is there aren't that many people who do, who do diagnosis and who are, you know, especially with the young children. So it's harder for young children. It's a little bit easier for first, you know, for first graders. But what about even in, even in the school system? Does, don't you do, do don't uh, the psychologists do the about? <laughs> but they can determine eligibility. Yeah. But we can't give the autism diagnosis, so we give the eligibility developmentally delayed, and then when they're old enough to get the diagnosis, and we're frustrated too okay. because we can't get kids yet okay. so fast just, enough, and insurance doesn't pay for it. Right, um, it's a problem. Um, it, it's you know keep calling, like go on whatever waiting list, um, you know whatever like a short list for calls. Like what, can you come at the drop of a dime if somebody cancels? Um, call around. Um, there are um, you know at UW Autism Center. The list, the wait varies, but it's we don't have a great big waiting list, but we also take fewer insurance. Um, companies but we do have a scholarship program so you know asking places if they have if they have scholarships um, Ben's fund is um, so feet um, families for effective autism treatment has a, um, a fund that families can use for services they can apply for it up to I want to say 2,000 but maybe it's 1,000 um, so that would be something to look into if 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 cost is an issue, if there's a shorter waiting list at a more expensive place. So those are the, the suggestions. Um, and then just starting to, you know, if the question is, you'd like to think that if the question is about how can the educational program be tweaked, you'd think that it could be tweaked without the diagnosis, ideally, right, if you just think. Um, or, yeah. Oh, we do a lot. Okay, so the UW Autism Center does a ton of training. Um, we have, yeah, I mean, that's like one of our big things. So we have clinical services, we have research, and we have training. And um, we have lots of activities this month, actually, free activities. I, I, it, not on, it was, and some of them are on, I don't remember what the titles are. But, okay, so I didn't bring and should have, so we have a newsletter. That, ha that has um, all if you, it, the autism awareness events that we're doing, and it talks about the training activities that we have, and um, we, we consult to lots of school systems, so we're available for that. And we'd love, you know, that's what we'd love to do. We have, um, we have one um, special educator one, and three um, behavior therapists who are like on the training and outreach team, and, and that's what they like to do. This, in fact, this, the summer, we're, we usually have a summer intensive training, but we're not doing that. We're traveling to different parts of the state that are less well served and, um, and doing different trainings there. Uh, but, you know, basic, like the ABCs of autism in the classroom is like, it's easy, you know, it's, it's what we do. Yes? I was just wondering if um, parents um, with a child, the parents that are autistic, ever come to you and you know, ask? Do parents who have autism? Yeah, that they have autism, or one of the parents has autism, do they ever come to you and ask? So um, it can happen, yes, is the short answer. But yeah. Isn't there a huge, I mean, how big is the genetic component? It's, it's, it's. 90%? No. No, it's, um, you know, it's hard to estimate the, like the genetic from the other environmental. I mean, the idea is that there's going to be some genetic vulnerability, um, but then also you need some other conditions under which, because everybody, 
you know, all the siblings don't end up with autism. So there has to be some combination, complex combination of factors that contribute. But there, um, but there is, yes, there is. We, I mean, we see that in when one sibling has it. And there is, there's something called the broader autism phenotype, um, which um, is defined as family members having behaviors that, res that don't, aren't the full-blown autism but resemble, like they may like, really like having things done a certain way or they may feel uncomfortable in social situations and not go to, you know, not spend time in large groups, things like that, or sensory things. So, uh, but yeah, we have, I mean, we, you know, we actually, we at the UW Autism Center, we serve um, early childhood through young adulthood um, in Tacoma. Um, we have a Tacoma site too and they see somewhat older um, individuals too, but yeah, there are parents and there are adults who come and say, you know, I think I, <laughs> I think I may have autism. Well, it just seems like um, oftentimes with the children that we see, the parents um, pretty much are on the spectrum. That's they would never say that, but it appears to be more objectively on the outside of the uh, Yeah, I mean, that, that can certainly happen, either having traits or but then it, you know there are lots of kids whose parents aren't all, as well but yeah there are certainly instances where um, and because it, it is genetic I mean there's some genetic factor we don't know how it's not as simple as inheriting brown eyes or blue eyes from a, from your parents but it is you know there is definitely a genetic component identical to and we know this from tw studies of identical twins um, they have a, um, a, a pretty high concordance rate it's, but it's not a hundred percent it's not 90% even. It's more like, you know, 70-ish percent. And then if you go down to um, non-identical twins, it's less. And then siblings, it's, it's less. But, uh, but it's a big range for, even for the identical twins. Would, would you say it could be 70%? I, well, I'm, that's off the top. Of, I mean, it, off the top. Why is that never mentioned in the research? If they would, you know, so the, the for identical twins? Percentage of the genetic twins. Because if there's more. Um, People becoming autistic children, um, it's coming from somewhere, and maybe the parents were diagnosed. Yeah, and then maybe maybe physicians will be asking, um, you know, be studying history and then their, you know, personal health history and then saying what the right possibilities are. I think that you know, if you go for if you bring a child for genetic testing, they'll definitely. You know, you will get asked that question. What is your family? They'll do a very clear family history. Some research studies do a very, very extensive family history, uh, and it's not just it's not just autism spectrum. It's um, depression and anxiety. You know, there are other things also. Um, so yeah, so there are you know there are certain liability. Yeah. Uh, is there a lot being done to to try to educate people that this isn't? Horrible, horrible diagnosis, and I know some parents who are resisting the diagnosis, and they just didn't do anything for their child because they don't want the child being labeled right. You know, that's yeah. And I know the one father said, "Well, this is just too close to home." And I said, "Yeah, this isn't a bad thing. It doesn't mean the child right. Yeah. So that's a. I mean, that's a really important issue. And when I so when I in the 80s, it you know it 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 was more. You know, it was a, just a there was less hope, um, and you know when I would diagnose somebody at at the age of four because we didn't really do it early. You know, we would say, you know, your child has autism and will probably continue to have autism. And now, when I diagnose a child at at two, it's like, well, you know, you're, right now the behaviors that we're seeing fits the pattern of, of autism. You know, there are lots of things that you can do there, um, and these children change a lot over time and that and there and children some children do no longer meet the diagnostic criteria for autism at three or four and which is totally true um, so there are uh, there was just an article on the optimal outcome children but so there are there are kids who especially when diagnosed at young ages who you know kind of leave the autism spectrum they may have like residual language issues or some you know quirky behaviors or they may not You know, at every talk, I realize how much isn't isn't out there. Um, you know, I, I we need to do something. About Any that. book recommendations? For, you know, I know there's some good books. But... Um, 
Well, so these are very, you know, they're very different kinds of questions that, to, you know, to me are, I mean, I think a lot of the books that are designed for parents are more positive in now. And so I actually, I have a book that's, I'm not trying to sell this book, it was 2006 and it's like outdated, but it does, you know, it has quotes from parents that include, you know, just from other parents, like suggestions for parents of newly diagnosed kids. And it's like, you know, th you know the di your child is still the child that, you know, you came in with and you're leaving this room with the same child. It's just, there's a different, there's a label for the behaviors and that's to help you understand and predict and work with the behaviors. Um, but, you know, I, I don't, I don't, it's hard to know what other people say at, during the diagnostic process, but I think that that process in general is pretty understudied. Why don't you study that, Ben? Because it's, um, it's a very in, incredibly intensive time. I mean, families will remember like what the person was wearing who told them this and what the color of the wallpaper, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, parents remember detail, but then they, they also may not remember anything else that's said after they hear the word autism. So it's, um, and it could be that they are told that and then they, they, they could, weren't able to hear it at the time. And we don't have like, you know, parent to parent, that might be. Um, so, you know, I don't know how exactly how they're trained, but parent to parent is, is the concept is great. Um, it's parents who really help other families go through the this, this stage, you know, go like survive through the, the stages that they've gone through. And um, it could be very powerful to be able to talk to another parent who can say, you know, I felt the same way, but look, you know, things are, you know, things are better. There are support groups. Um, to th so FEET, again, would be a good organization to call. It's because it's a parent organization and they, they do lots of different things there. It's a F-E-A-T. Um, but there, yeah, there are parent support groups. It's hard, you know, you, you need to find a person that, um, you know, who you can continue to ask questions to through the process because different questions arise and you need, okay, an IEP meeting. Okay, well, what do I do? What does that mean? And do I bring someone for support? Do I not? Do I take a tape recorder? Do I not? What do I ask for? What's, what's the most important? What do I want to get out of it? You know, so there are just, there are, like throughout the, this journey, there are so many different questions that arise um, that it's great if you can find somebody who, you know, you can, you know, come in and get a booster visit with. And sometimes it's the pediatrician. I mean, sometimes developmental behavioral pediatricians really, you know, have a, their finger on the pulse of things. Um, but, it could, you know, it could be social workers or psychologists or others. You're welcome. Thank you.